Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Faith Matters where you, our viewers, set the agenda. Thank you first of all to all of you for inundating us with emails and faxes. We really have received a large volume of questions and let me assure you, all the questions we are getting, we are going to be addressing them over the numerous programs we have in the coming weeks. So if your question isn't answered today, let me assure you it will be answered in the coming weeks. So please do keep sending them in and it's a sheer volume which means that we have Mashallah, a whole uh, variety of questions to be answering today. Um, the other thing, just from the outset, I would remind viewers, I've talked about questions, is where do you send your questions to? Well, it's faithmatters at mta.tv. The email, it, once again, is faithmatters at mta.tv. And for those of you still looking to use the fax, the fax for the UK is 44687. 8037. The other question we keep being asked by many viewers is about previous programs. Well, you can get these now on YouTube, MTA Online 1, and put in the subject that you're interested in, and you'll see the program that's been covered. With that, it's an absolute pleasure today to be introducing a very distinguished panel, and if I can begin with, immediately on my right, Maulana Abdul Khani Jahangir Khan Sahib. Uh, Jahangir Saab is uh, head of our French desk. Jahangir Saab, welcome. Uh, to the program today. To his right is again a familiar face on Faith Matters, Molana Azar Hanif Sahib. Uh, welcome from across the US, As of course. Salam. As Salam. viewers will know, he Azar Saab is Naib Amir of the United States. And to his right is someone who's perhaps more familiar to our Arab viewers. Um, he's a, a regular uh, scholar on Al Hivar Al Mubashir, which is the equivalent Arab version of Faith Matters. It's of course the meme Abu Dhaka Sahib, a renowned Arab scholar who joins us from the Middle East. Thank Welcome you. to Faith Matters. Sir. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, today's uh, Faith Matters is very much a themed uh, program and it's covering an issue which is in many circles within Islam regarded contentious perhaps, but it's also one which does require a lot of discussion and clarification. And of course this is the subject of Khatam al Nabiin, Seal of the Prophets. Um, Throughout the world, this since the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, to the current age, there has been discussion, there has been debate, and in some circumstances quite heated debate about definitions, clarity. And what we're hoping to do today from the questions we have, and of course, in, more importantly, in the answers you provide, that we'll be able to address some of the key issues surrounding the issue of Khatm al -Nabin. And with that, I want to go straight into the first question, which we have from uh, Rashid Ahmed Sahib from North London. Jazakumullah for your question. And he writes this. Those opposed to Amdiyat in Islam have carried out a vigorous campaign of falsification that Amdi Muslims do not believe in Khatm al Nabuat and God forbid are guilty of downgrading the exalted and supreme status of the Holy Prophet وسلم, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Could you please explain how the claim of the Amdi Muslim community is supported by the Holy Quran. Jangir Saab, if I could come to you first of all. This is an allegation at times which has put to the many Jamaat members throughout the world and it's an allegation raised against the Jamaat continuously. Perhaps you can sort of tell us right from the outset what does it mean from an Amdiya Muslim perspective? Well from the very beginning we have to make one thing very very clear and it is that this allegation is totally false. When they say that we try to downgrade the exalted status of the Prophet Muhammad this is, a, this is a lie. On the contrary, as you will see hopefully today in this program, we are the ones who recognize the lofty status of the Prophet Muhammad much more than any other Muslim group does. And uh, who better than the actual founder, the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, uh, the Promised Messiah himself, Mr. Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian, uh, Allah's peace be upon him. Uh, let's see what he said about the, the Khatam al nabiyyin or the Khatam al nabuwa as they understand it to be the finality of prophethood. Did he believe in that or not? He said, and I'm quoting from his book, Pairam Sula, he said, without a doubt, I hold that anyone who denies the Khatam al nabuwa is irreligious and is out of the pale of Islam. And uh, actually the verse of the Khatam al nabiyyin which is the, the whole crux of the matter, uh, you know, today, which is only one verse in the Holy Quran, this is played every single day on MTA International. So the whole world will have heard that verse being recited on our 
international television channel. So to say that we don't believe in khat, uh, the Khatman Nabiyyin or the Khatman Nabuwa is a blatant allegation, a blatant lie. Azar Sab, it's a falsehood. It's an allegation made against the Jamaat. And we'll come on in a few moments onto the definition um, about what it actually means from its Arabic context as well. But again, just taking this concept further in terms of what it means to the Jamaat. Um, those who may have attended our annual gatherings, whether they're in Tokyo to Washington and further afield as well, wherever they're held in the world, has all repeatedly at the International Jalsa where it's held here in the United Kingdom, is often seen there's the international bath which occurs, the allegiance at the hand of the Khalifa of the time. Perhaps you can sort of elaborate a bit on that for our viewers' benefit in terms of what's actually said, what does it actually mean? Yes, well, I, I appreciate the question by Mr. Rashid Ahmed because it's so important to us. We are being defined by a, a group that has not first checked to see what are the requirements or what are the expectations of one who joins this community, who is part of this fold called the Ahmadiyya Jamaat. I happen to be from a family of converts. My parents, they joined this community. And so I would then join from what join, faith? Well, they, they came from the Christian faith. Okay. But they joined Islam and this particular group within the Muslim fold, and they were asked to uh, affirm certain principles to be a Muslim. So there is a standard. They, be, they affirm the principles of every Muslim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. I believe that uh, I bear witness and uh, one God, and I bear witness in Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. This is in the beginning of the actual initiation to the community, so showing that we are joining the fold of Islam, coming from whichever group we happen to come from. Indeed. But say you are already a Muslim. This is just a reaffirmation then, it's not an affirmation. You are reaffirming this basic shahada. Then within that very condition of uh, joining, the bayah you call it, the initiation ceremony, any Muslim who would come initially to Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani when he was alive, he would ask him to make this particular statement as well, with hand in hand, that you affirm this to be part of the Jamaat which I am the founder, I am the, the leader of. So to be clear, and for the benefit of our viewers, before anyone enters the fold of Amdiyat in Islam, and of course we hold this to be the true Islam, mm -hmm. they have to actually declare very clearly, unequivocally, mm -hmm. what the actual status of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, is exactly. within the context of exactly. Islam. And it's part very much of the declaration and affirm yes. affirmation yes. of faith. So what I mean is two things. One, you affirm that he is a messenger of Allah subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala, which every Muslim must do to become part of the fold of Islam. Okay. Two, you then, the special status of him, which we mentioned or talking about today, is, excuse me, is in the initiation. So these are the words I want to share with the, the audience so of they course. know what was he asking people to say. He says, I have firm faith that Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Khatama Nabiyin, the seal of all the prophets. These are the actual words which he would request the initiate to repeat after him in joining his fold. And we have all been doing that, my parents did it, we repeat it whenever we go through this process of any type of uh, uh, ceremony called the bayat. So this shows again that uh, we truly believe in this, we support this, we promote this. It is part and parcel of who we are as, as Ahmadi Muslims. Well, it's a central tenant. It begs the question as to what is the dispute and then it really does come down to the definition. And um, Tamim Sop, if I could come to you with this, you're a renowned Arab, Arab, Arab scholar in this context as well. Um, the whole issue of language comes into play here. The meaning of uh, khatam, khatim, you know, these things. We have organizations who, whose sole purpose is actually focused on the destruction of Amdiyat within Islam, and they call themselves khatam in organizations. Mm -hmm. Yet, as Azar Saab has said, and Jangir Saab have said, and we all indeed believe that this is a central part of our belief. It's a central part of our practice, it's what we profess. Mm -hmm. So if we could perhaps go f and move into this concept of definition and the use within the language, and there's no better way to start than the mother of all languages, which is Arabic. Mm -hmm. So if I could come to you, sir, with that. Okay, well, um, maybe first of all, we should show what kind of concept 
what do we mean by Khatam and Nabiyyin as Ahmadis and what is their concept about Khatam and Nabiyyin? According to them, they thought Khatam means the last prophet. They, they limit this concept to be just the last prophet. And when you say they, these are the opponents who The alleged. opponents, yes. yes. The opponents, they limit this meaning to be the last prophet. And also, they themselves contradict this by believing that Jesus will come later and he will be having a mission uh, for the holy human beings, including the Muslims. Mm -hmm. So even if they want to keep Khatam al Nabiyyin as they believe, they are contradicting it themselves. Okay. So they should think about it, first of all. But our, uh, our concept, which is based uh, uh, on a very solid basis on the Arabic language, Arabic usage, you will find that it is a very comprehensive, very dignifying concept uh, for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. According to uh, the Arabic language, if we combine the word which is khatam or khatim or khatama or khatima, which means if it's uh, 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 for female or for male, no okay. problem, and combine it with the plural of human beings, it will have just an exclusive one meaning, which is the highest in status, the uh, one who reached to the high level, to the top, the where the pinnacle, law. the pinnacle, and nobody can reach this pinnacle after him. And this person collected all of the attributes, all of the capacities of the people before him, mm -hmm. and everybody will come after him, will have some attributes uh, which have his seal on this, which means his seal will be shown in everybody who is coming after him. This is a general concept of Khatim, mm -hmm. with, uh, co uh, which is combined with a plural of a humans. So to be absolutely clear, in the okay. use in the Arab language mm -hmm. where this word originates from and how it's applied, mm -hmm. it's quite clear that when applied to the plural of, in, in the context of a human personage, whoever that may be, mm -hmm. to an individual, mm -hmm. that actually means supreme, the best of, exalted, and reaching that pinnacle status. That's it, and they can find in the uh, books of heritage lots of uh, examples about this. You can find, for example, this person is Khatam al awliya this person is Khatam al muhaqqaqeen And those are Khatam al perhaps for our English uh, okay. viewers, you could just elaborate what those okay. words mean. Khatam al awliya means uh, Khatam, uh, the people who are having a very high level saints. of the saints, saints. Uh, saints with Allah, uh, Khatam al awliya That doesn't mean at any sense he's the last one but means he is a great saint, and this great, a great saint uh, has uh, collected all of the attributes of the old saints which we know, and any other saints will come after him, will have some attributes of him. him. So he's the best amongst them. This is regarding yes. the saints, and regarding the poets, for example, uh, once when a great poet, uh, his name is Abu Tammam, very great poet, uh, when he died, one of his friends, he wrote uh, some poem, and he said, he is Khatam al-Shu'ara, the seal of the poets, poets, poets. Uh, poets. So uh, uh, that means he is a great uh, poet. Uh, so when Allah attributed this to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that means he is the greatest, the highest prophet. And this is the only, by the way, this is the only evidence in the Holy Quran that give the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this supreme and high status. They cannot find any clear other evidence that shows the high and exalted and supreme status of the Holy Prophet. Because sometimes even in their thought and their belief, some uh, prophets, they have different, they have attributes, they have capacities where even the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not get. And this is another problem. So we, they should understand their concept of Khatam al Nabiyyin is incomplete and it's in just uh, regarding the exalted and supreme. Uh, of uh, status of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we look back to the verse where the Khatam al is mentioned, Allah in this context was talking about the uh, issue of prophethood, uh, sorry, uh, brotherhood, uh, uh, sorry, fatherhood, fatherhood, <laughs> fatherhood yes. uh, sorry. Yeah. The, uh, Allah said, uh, the Holy Prophet, ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين. Muhammad is not a father of any man out, uh, from you, but he is Rasulullah, he is messenger of Allah, 
and the seal of the prophets. This verse means if you want to look how can we gain uh, the or how, how can we belong to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu you Alaihi should, you should understand you will belong to him to be like sons to him if you will follow him completely as messenger of Allah and he is a great messenger even the other prophets are like sons to him and the whole context, uh, context was talking about uh, the uh, fatherhood of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu uh, and so this verse is praising the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is giving him his right and dignified uh, status. It has nothing to do with the uh, uh, sequence of the prophets. For example, the, Allah did not say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not the first prophet, is not in the middle of the prophets, he is the last prophet. Yes. <laughs> no, he said he is the messenger of Allah and he is the seal of the prophets. And at the beginning of the same surah, which is Surah Al-Ahzab, where this verse is mentioned, Allah mentioned very clearly that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu is closer to the, uh, to the believers more than themselves and his wives are their mothers. النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم If the Holy Quran uh, said the Holy Prophet Sallallahu is uh, or the, the wives of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu are the mothers so who is the father? It's very easy. Mm -hmm. So the whole issue was regarding the fatherhood because it was raised. Hadrat Zaid is the son of the Holy Prophet and you know the whole story regarding uh, this issue and it's very well known for our opponents and uh, I think other viewers. Indeed. I think this question, Nchangi Sahib, if I could just pick up on that. Um, you're, you're indeed a scholar in your own right in a linguistic uh, capacity as well, a speaker of several languages. And it does sort of dawn on me from, you know, just the brief discussions we've had thus far, that it comes down to a misinterpretation in the quarters of many opponents of Jamaat Amdiya within Islam, that they actually take this word um, and erroneously apply it. Obviously, as we've heard, it's quite clear what it means in its original Arabic. But I, you know, for example, in Urdu, we often heard hear the word khatam ho gaya, this thing has ended. And it's almost like they're taking the use in another language and applying it back. And we've heard quite clearly that in Arabic it means something very different. Perhaps you could just sort of develop that concept and also, you know, and how, if you like, our opponents then interpret this as meaning something which obviously is not correct in the original Arabic. You're absolutely correct to say that there is a misunderstanding at the basis of, of uh, the, the, the misinterpretation of the word khatam. And this is a linguistic uh, feature in the subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent, as you mentioned. Because in Urdu, for example, and also in a few other languages uh, around, even in, in maybe Turkish as well, the word khatam will take on another meaning. Of course. And it would mean to end something. So if in Urdu you say khatam karna, yes. it means to end, end it. Yes. Now th that meaning is a new meaning which has come in, into the language which was not in the original Arabic, it has come to mean that later on over the centuries. Now, when people understand it in their own language, they then erroneously transpose that meaning once again. But this time it's come with a new meaning. Now, we have to of course realize as well that this misunderstanding is also among the Arabs today. But it is also evident that the beliefs of many of the Arabs today have been influenced by some of the writers in Islam of the subcontinent. And those who have held those beliefs based on their erroneous understanding of the word khatam or khatam or khatim, they have written, this has been translated into Arabic and now many Arabs have read their books and now they are also confused about the real meaning. But as uh, 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 Al-Ustad uh, Tamim Abdaqa just said, he said that nowhere you will find this, uh, this meaning in that sense. It's always in the sense of the best, the most excellent, the highest and containing all the qualities of the group of which is being uh, described as belonging to. Khatam of this group, then you'll have the qualities of that group. Nowhere does it mean anything you know, like last. So this is definitely a problem when those people start interpreting the verse Khatam and Nabiyin, they are looking at it through the lens of Urdu. Mm -hmm. or through the lens of, of Bengali or the lens of Turkish and so they're not seeing it properly. Another very uh, well-known example in Urdu is the word Mushkil. Mushkil in Urdu, like we say, mm -hmm. 
It means that it's very difficult. Yes. But in Arabic, mushkil does not mean difficult. Mushkil means a problem, it means a difficulty. It does not mean the adjective difficult. But then again, it's, it slightly changes in meaning and sometimes radically changes in meaning when it enters a new language. And so this is one problem. So the scholars who, who's, who reflect on this verse have to bear these problems in mind while they're doing so. And they have to separate their mother tongues from the Arabic language so that they can arrive at the truth. And also maybe there is, <coughs> sorry for no, no, of course. Actually, maybe there is another reason also. Yes, the Arabs were affected so much by the thoughts and beliefs of uh, the uh, scholars in the uh, Indian continent because actually India has lots of great scholars in the last maybe 200 years. Yes, oh. that's correct. But actually this misconception uh, was found much earlier even in the, uh, like in the Arab lexicon, the Arabic lexicons. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because sometimes the beliefs uh, affected the meaning, and this is the problem. Actually, mm, if we look carefully about the concept of Khatam al Nabiyin and also some other linked uh, uh, things uh, to Khatam al Nabiyin, linked beliefs, uh, we'll reach to, uh, to something which is very close to, th yes, the last of the, of the prophets but it's not accurate meaning. It does not mean there will be no prophet after him because everybody from the Muslims believe Jesus will come in the last days. Indeed, you highlighted there's an almost contradiction and mm -hmm. I'm sure many of us, I, I indeed know myself as well, I've mm -hmm. been in discussions and mm -hmm. about this, that you know, even if you accept for a moment mm -hmm. the false premise which they say that Khatam Nabin means the last prophet, the final prophet, mm -hmm. then how do you sort of uh, you know, coin that with the actual coming of Hazrat Isa al -Islam. And I think mm -hmm. then you normally hear silence and there's some sort of squabbles over the fact is, is Hazrat Isa al -Islam? Mm -hmm. it's a question to be posed, would he be a prophet, would he not be a prophet? And yes. for that there is no answer. Just as a sort of, on a very base level in terms of the Arabic language, if I could just come to that. Mm -hmm. in the Arab Peninsula and the various Arab countries, when this word is used, mm -hmm. you described it in its application to poets mm -hmm. and uh, saints. But if an Arab is talking to an Arab and he uses the word khatm, mm -hmm. what does it actually mean? This will not at all mean he's the last. So it'll never mean last mm -hmm. in yes, the language. Yes, and this reminded me about a little story that by before, means, uh, Jazakallah, uh, the Khalifa Rabi, rahimahullah, he was studying here, I think, uh, earlier when he was a young man, and uh, he had uh, uh, an Egyptian teacher. Uh, so he wrote uh, a composition, something like that, about the Amawad Emperor, uh, Empire. And he wrote Marwan ibn Muhammad, who was the last emperor of the Amawad dynasty. Uh, he is the Khatam of Khulafa means the king of Bani Umayyah. Yeah. Then his teacher said, no, 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 this is incorrect. He said, how come? Bec he said, you should write his Akhir. He's not Khatam. He said, why you do not accept the concept of Khatam and Nabiin? So, mm -hmm. Because, you know, the beliefs are affecting sometimes their, uh, the language, uh, or not the language, their understanding of these things. But the usage is much more important. So the word Akhir means last. Means last. Mm -hmm. And it's very <coughs> repeatedly used in the Holy Quran for something which is very well known for everybody, which is the last day, the day of resurrection. It's mentioned in the Holy Quran at every place as al al Akhir, not al al Khatam or al al Khatam. It's not mentioned like that. So Akhir is uh, when you want to describe something to be the last, there is uh, one, ex not one, but uh, you, know, you cannot say Khatam is giving this meaning at all. Khatam means the best, uh, the highest, and this is a dignifying uh, kind of uh, uh, maybe word or, uh, or combination between two, two words to describe this person as a great person, not the last person. Hazar Saab, if I could come to you, how strange our opponents, they raise an allegation against us for defining this concept of Khatam Nabin in its pristine form, in its uh, definition in Arabic, as all Arab scholars understand it, mm -hmm. and the Muslim scholars and other Muslim scholars alike. Yet, and the allegation is on us to give the Holy Prophet an exalted status, um, and yet they want to sort of define it as even the word of God, as we've just learned in the other parts, hasn't used the word last 
It's used the word Khatam to mean supreme. And perhaps you could just comment on that, but also in the context of what it means in English as well. We, we've heard the word seal when we uh, interpret this in the Holy Quran. It's talked about the seal of the prophets. And again, you know, sitting back, we always hear seal can have two meanings as well. So perhaps you could yes. sort of focus on those. You know, it, it's uh, so important because, as you say, here is a common ground actually for all Muslims. Who does not have love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad Jesus. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Who does not believe of all the prophets ever sent? And we, we talk about 124,000 prophets being sent in the world. Who does not believe that whether he came first or came last or came anywhere in the middle, but he was the best? Every single Muslim believes this. In fact, every Ummah before the Islam, they believed the same thing, that their prophet was the best. The Jews believed Musa al Islam was the best. The Christians believe Jesus al Islam was the best. Every group believes that their ultimate prophet, nothing supersedes or superior to him. Every single one of us, including every Amity Muslim in this world, believes the exact same thing. It should be our common ground that after he has left us, we all owe allegiance to this individual who we believe is our common leader. There's no difference there. And why? We believe that not just for us, the whole world should follow him being this superior prophet above all the rest. So we mentioned the traditions that uh, he saw himself making the circuits of the Kana Kaaba and all what prophets were lining up behind him, including Hazrat Musa, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, showing his superiority to them, they would have to follow him. So this is our belief. But the word itself, again, I mean beautifully put by uh, Tamim Sahab and also mentioned by Jahangir Sahab, it, it conveys the same principle. So in English, we never say in translation of Quran, and I have here in front of us our, our own Quran, which, uh, which is translated in Mulvi Sher Ali Sahib, who did it years ago. Uh, we see the translation of this verse, which is quoted here, that uh, Muhammad Sallallahu is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. The word here in English is used, as you say, as seal. We, so, never, we never say best, we never say last. Yeah. And I've seen this same translation in many Qurans of other translators from different sects throughout the world. They use the exact same word, seal. Why did they not use the word last? There's no mention of There's the no word mention. akhir. As uh, you know, it sometimes yeah. is in brackets, you know, this, or uh, asterisk is put in down below. You see someone has said, uh, seal also means last. Mm. So you're importing a meaning which isn't apparent even to the translator of these words in Arabic. Because the word seal conveys, as was beautifully presented, a much wider sense than being last. The sense of perfection. All of the excellences are combined in this individual. It flows in him and flows from him into others. So that he now is not just our leader. He is leading us toward the excellence, the highest which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give a prophet. He is giving us through his uh, advent in this world. And after he has left this world again, we will see him as constantly leading us toward these higher excellences, which is a, a phenomenal concept. So the excellence is in his, his person. The excellence is in his position as our leader, leading us toward excellence. The excellence is in his word, the last word which we believe, of course, is the last word, but also the best word. And therefore, the excellence comes in his ummah, which rises up to the highest levels. This is the meaning of seal. Yeah. Uh, um, Sahib, just taking this concept of seal, and I think it's clear from what Hazrat Sahib has said, in English, you have two definitions of seal. Seal means to close, or it can mean to actually imprint. And Hazrat Sahib has already highlighted about this is what imprinting, almost the attributes of setting what's best. So when a monarch or anyone of any status actually imparts this, it means it carries their authorization, if you like. It's authentic. Um, the same applies in this context. Exactly. And this is exactly where I'm going to bring together what uh, Al-Ustad Tamim and also Azhar Sahib have said. It's a question of fatherhood and of the seal. Now, there, you said that the seal can have a, a sense of closure to it, but in, the, but in this, this verse, the Holy Prophet Muhammad is being said not to be the father of any of the, our men, the ordinary men that are Rijal, just ordinary people. He's not the father of those. So the question is of fatherhood, and fatherhood has nothing to do with closure. Fatherhood has something to do with imprinting. 
just as a father leaves his print on his son yes. to such a degree that sometimes you can look at a son and you know who the father is because he bears his qualities either physical or his traits inside his character traits as well so you can know that that's somebody's son so the here the seal it also means that that you are you are saying the enemies of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that oh the, look at this prophet mm -hmm. you know he has no no sons so no one will continue his mission when he dies there will be no sons, so his mission will die with him. This was the vain hope. But Allah is saying, what are you talking about? This is not an ordinary person like you. He is not the father who is going to leave his print on ordinary rij'al, ordinary men. He is a messenger of Allah. And not only that, he is going to leave his print on Nabiyyin. The Nabiyyin are going to, when you look at the prophets, you will see the print of him on them. And he will, he will authenticate them. If they are authentic, if you want to know if they are authentic, you have to look at the seal, who is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu If they have some qualities of him, of him in them, then they are authentic. But if they bear no resemblance to him, then they are not authentic. He is the real thing. All the others are just like prints. Can you imagine the high status to which this verse has raised him? Now, as has been said, we all believe, and all Muslims should believe, that he is the chief of all prophets. But where in the Quran, in any other verse, will you see that he's been raised to this status? That he's left his print of all his qualities on not only ordinary men, but on prophets themselves. The highest level to which humankind can reach. This is the only verse. So now, if you call it last, mm -hmm. there is no greatness. What is the greatness in coming last? In anything. Mm -hmm. I'm the last. Does that mean any greatness of any kind? On the contrary, and closure. Now, what will be the meaning of the verse if you say that he is not the father of any of your men and he is coming to finish something as well? You know? But what's the great news in that? That's like already you're depressed, he's not getting this, and now you're learning that he's also not going to get even that. So nothing is left. So this interpretation of last is absolutely erroneous. It has no basis in language. It has no basis in usage, linguistic usage. It has no basis in history. It has no basis in the Quran. And because of the status of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu it cannot be applied to this verse. It's impossible. The, the concept of Khatam Nabiin, and it was almost saying that he is not father to another man in the context of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, but he is Khatam Nabiin. It was almost saying that this then elevates the status above that of fatherhood, because it's an imprint, it's, a, it's an elevation. It was, wasn't it? it yes. was a, a, a definite attack on him as a man, yes. even amongst Arabs, those, who prided those themselves the in being the able time. to produce, yeah. produce children, male yes. children, because they are the same people, mind you, that were burying their girls alive mm -hmm. out of their sense of pride in some families, not all, but this was a sense of pride. Here is the man who claiming to be the greatest messenger, the greatest one that God loves, and he doesn't even have a son. You know, they were attacking him on all, le all levels, including this one. And part of the answer, therefore, to that is, look, yes, he doesn't have a male physical heir, but look what he will have, like Hazrat Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Hazrat Ibrahim had one son, Hazrat Ismail, who he was ready to sacrifice, as a result of which Allah said, you, now your children will, will be like the stars in the sky, you can't account them. Well, they are not physical children in, in a full sense, spiritual heirs to Hazrat Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Same is true here in the case of Holy Prophet Muhammad Sorry, yes. actually, for that. Uh, but what's happened? Allah preserved the high and supreme status of the Holy Prophet through this kind of plan. Why? For Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah told him, "Okay, uh, your offspring will have the prophethood, and uh, they will have the book, which means the law uh, of Allah." Uh, then he said, uh, "Everybody, Hadrat uh, Ibrahim, uh, is this for everybody?" Allah said, "No." These who are transgressors, who, are, who do not deserve this, will not get it. Which means just part of the offspring of Hadrat Ibrahim السلام, will gain uh, this heritage of Hadrat Ibrahim. While the Holy Prophet وسلم, Allah make, uh, or gave him a plan that only the very selected people from the Muslim Ummah will be like the sons of him. They will take his heritage, they will keep his heritage, they will develop his heritage, they will be like the custodians of this heritage to the uh, end of the times. So this plan preserved the high status of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's on the contrary as the others they thought it might be 
um, maybe uh, uh, improper for the Holy Prophet not to have uh, children from his uh, own blood, Allah said, oh, I saved the Holy Prophet by this mean, by this plan. Not anybody can be uh, from his blood uh, or uh, can be uh, referred to him or uh, to be considered as his from offspring until, uh, unless he is not deserving that. So this is very important point. Another point that uh, reminded me regarding the seal, uh, actually it's a very good translation when they translate it as a seal, but still it's not very comprehensive. Because khatam means in Arabic means the ring, and in the ring there is the seal. And, okay. and khatam, there are two readings by the way for this verse, it's khatam and khatim, which means the Holy Prophet is like the ring for the whole of the prophets, and the ring is a symbol for authority. Of course. Yeah, the king, when they crown the king, they give him the ring that symbolizes that he is now the king. Yes. And it's very well known even in the Arabian Nights and other stories like yes. uh, the ring of Solomon and other of things, course, yes. which means when he has the ring, that means he has the authority, the authority and has the capacities, yes. even the magic ca uh, capacities or something mm -hmm. like that. And also he is, in the other reading, he is the one who is making or leaving the, the, the imprints on others, which means it's a very comprehensive. In Arabic, actually, the word is very comprehensive, but still we are not able even to cover all of the, this concept. First of all, let me just also uh, uh, um, address some important points which might create the conflict. Yes, we do believe Islam is the last religion. The, and also the Holy Quran is the last book yes. and there will not be any book and any other religion after the Holy Prophet so the Amdiya Muslim community believes that totally, but, utterly, yes, no yes. issue and the meaning of the seal of the prophets Khatam al Nabiyyin it has some sort of meaning before as all of the prophets uh, has uh, all of the attributes of the prophets are uh, collected or are incorporated in the Holy Prophet Sallallahu himself and in the future or after the coming of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all the capacities and the attributes will be in his followers and they will be even higher in these capacities than prophets but and not necessarily they will be named as prophets because the elevation of prophethood became very high or reached to uh, to the maximum to, to to the to the top to the uh, uh, and nobody can reach that so because of that it's a relative issue in other nations somebody who may, who might be less in capacities and less in spirituality than uh, a scholar in the islamic ummah or a saint in the islamic ummah will be named there as a prophet but here and this, uh, from this angle, we cannot name, his, uh, name him as a prophet. I mean, this great saint in Islam. So the issue of prophethood does not mean, I mean, the Khatam al nabiyyin does not mean there will be a prophet after prophet coming uh, uh, after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not our concept. Our concept is that this has everything to do with the great status also for his followers because if he's the highest or the supreme or has the exalted uh, uh, status so his followers they should be uh, also the greatest and you know according to the whole Quran yes so how come they are khayru ummatan ukhrijat linnas and they do not have the capacities to of reach that. Uh, even uh, yes. of the peoples of the past. Of the but people. It reminds us of the, the very famous saying of the Prophet mm. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well, sallam. when he said, uh, ulama u ummati ka anbiya ibani Israel. That even the ulama in my community, they will be like the prophets of Israel. Mm -hmm. Because as uh, Tamim Sahib said, the prophets of Israel were of a lower status spiritually mm -hmm. compared even to the ulama of Islam. Yes. But now to reach prophethood in Islam, it's gone so high that you have to do so much more to get there that they'll stop maybe at the level of alim. But even that will be like the status of prophethood in the past because it's all relative as has been explained very beautifully here. Also our, our opponents, they should leave this bad conjecture so adhan against us because actually this concept has nothing to do to justify the coming of al-Masih, the coming of the promised Messiah in the future. And it's not to justify his coming or to justify the claim of Hadrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Yes. It's to show the, 
correct, correct interpretation. Uh, interpretation and the correct <laughs> status of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They should understand this very clearly because for them, even if they have this, I, uh, as I said, it's minimized or shinged or maybe uh, uh, incorrect uh, meaning of Khatam al Nabiyyin, they're still uh, waiting for the Messiah to come. You see, yes. the, the thing is, one but little point I'd like to make mm -hmm. here, and uh, taking up on what, what uh, Tamim Sahib has said, even if thousands of false prophets come now, mm -hmm. can they affect the status of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How can they affect his status as Khatam al Nabiyyin? Mm -hmm. They can't affect even a tiny piece of it. They cannot. Mm -hmm. Even if millions of false prophets come, mm -hmm. so why do they the, the, do our opponents among the Muslims make you know groups called uh, Majlis Tahafuz Khatm al Nabuwa? Uh, they think that by the coming of Mizah Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, something is going to happen to the status of the Prophet It will be attacked, and oh my God, he's going to lose his status. What's this? No one can touch the Prophet. He was untouchable. Allah has completely preserved him from that. So they are making, as they, as they say, you know, a mountain out of a molehill. There's nothing happening there. But there's no to, link with that at all. This point is a crucial point because I think quite often, as Tamim Saab has said, that the opponents use the fact that our interpretation, our definition of Khatm al Nabuat is done to justify the, um, the claim of the Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who we accept to be the promised Messiah. Yet it's, you know, let's look at the two issues. There is a interrelation because the uh, promised Messiah presented this as well, but it was not to justify his own claim. It was to actually provide the correct definition, as we've heard from the original Arabic, as to what this actually means. It seems a bit of a nonsense um, on anyone, the part of our opponents, anyone really. Anyone who would read I, I would say, just read the writings of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad -Islam and his own personal impressions of Holy Prophet Muhammad. What, what were they for the benefit I of the I mean, US. in general, you will see a man who had such respect and love for him, saying that everything I have, Kullu min Muhammad, every single blessing I have and anyone has is through this, this Prophet. This is talking about Khatam al we, as his followers, receive every gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of Khudaya guidance or any other gift he may give us, whether that is a true dream or whatever, as he said, is, is available to his true followers, because of him. Mm -hmm. So he is not claiming that my coming is justified by my belief that he is not the last prophet, therefore I can come. Mm -hmm. He's claiming that I am who I am, <coughs> and every Muslim is, is who they are because they are following this great prophet. So as uh, Jahangir Sahib said, if a thousand false people would come, it wouldn't change his status. But also, if any true person would ever appear, like a Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, at any point in the time of the Ummah, it also would not affect his status because this person too is following him and getting the benefit from him alone. It in fact enhances his status. Yes. It's as if saying you are uh, uh, in a medical school and you are a PhD. That's great, you are, you are a doctor who has PhD. But how much better is a doctor PhD who can create other PhD doctors? Mm -hmm. That person is even more respected, more renowned, because he can create what he himself is. We are saying, therefore, one who would come would enhance his status. It's true. He is definitely Khatam al -Nabiyin. Look what he has done. He has raised amongst his own people one of his own personal status of being a prophet. Indeed. So the question it then begs the question, where do these other Muslims get their definitions from? I mean, let's, let's focus on the hadith, if I may, for a moment. Are there hadith which support what they're saying? Are they interpreting, which we've quite heard? Uh, already is uh, in an erroneous way what this actually means. It's already quite clear. Um, I'm far from a scholar of uh, the Arabic language or whatever, but from the discussions we've already had, the Quran mentions quite clearly the word khatam in what capacity it's mentioned, and elsewhere when the word last is mentioned, we've already heard that another word is used. <coughs> so where do these other Muslims get their well, definitions? Well, you should ask them, because when we've heard the verdict well, of I the welcome, Quran... I one of them. Yes, we, you know, we, of we've heard the verdict of the Quran, that should suffice any true Muslim. He would not look for anything elsewhere. If there is any hadith anywhere where a, a, a meaning other than that presented by the Quran, a contradictory one is presented, that hadith itself will fall. It has no value. But we do see that the, the, the term khatam is, is used in different hadith and is never ever used in the term of last. But that's, and, sorry, that's a crucial point for us as the Amdiya Muslim community. We accept that wherever there is a contradiction between the Quran, the word of God, 
and the Hadith, which is an interpretation or a saying of the Holy Prophet, that the Quran will undoubtedly, without exception, take precedence. But will have the upper hand in any case. But, I, but coming back to your point that you just made a little uh, while ago, just now, um, I wanted to say that the contrary of what, was, what you said was, is actually true. The allegation is the Jamaat uses the, 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 our understanding of Khatam al nabiyyin to prove the, the truthfulness of Mr. Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. And we say that has nothing to do with his coming or not coming. Whether he comes or not will change nothing of Khatam al Nabawa. Nothing at all. On the other hand, it's the opponents who use their meaning of Khatam al Nabawa to prevent anybody coming, any Messiah of any kind coming in the future. This is, the, this is the, the reality. They are the ones using that false meaning, meaning last in time, to prevent anybody as a Messiah coming in the future. We are not using it to, 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 to support anyone, but they are using it to reject someone. So the, it, actually the allegation should be turned back against them. Uh, actually this reminded me also of something which is very important. First of all, I would like to remind that we always uh, gave a challenge to everybody in different programs and even in many debates if they can find one single example of the usage of Khatam not for Khatam and Nabiyan also for other uh, other uh, sort of uh, other content yes like uh, in this combination which is Khatam or Khatim or Khatama or Khatima combined with uh, plural of humans to have the meaning of the last uh, from the Holy Quran, from a hadith, uh, from the Arab poem. And they uh, are not able to bring just one example. And we said uh, several times, we will lose this challenge if you just bring one example. And uh, this is very clear, actually, that, that was very clear. The other thing also, uh, when they have this misunderstanding, actually, they are, they are trying hardly to find uh, a kind of uh, to solve the problems which are uh, related to their uh, misunderstanding of Khatam al yeah, And for example, yes, actually their belief of Khatam al to be the last prophet, that means they are ready to reject anybody who's coming to claim himself to be a Messiah or, uh, or uh, that he is uh, sent by Allah while from the, uh, uh, another hand, they believe in the coming of Messiah, but uh, if the Messiah even descended from heaven as they think, they will reject him based on maybe this concept or for any other reasons, which means this actually is a very negative concept. This mm -hmm. concept has nothing to do with, uh, uh, let's say, first of all, it has nothing to do with the basis of the Arabic language, with the context of the Holy Quran, and also with the, the, the correct or uh, right uh, instance of the, the believers when they uh, should hear about some th somebody who, uh, declares who declares himself to be from God. Allah mentioned that very clearly in Surah Al-Mu'min, Surah Ghafir. If somebody is a liar, you should not form uh, a committee of Khatm al to <laughs> yes. to defend Islam against him. No. Mm -hmm. He said, وَإِيَّكُ كَاذِبًا فَعَلَيْهِ كَذِبُوا If he's a liar, then his lies will uh, we'll destroy turn, him, we'll will turn, we'll we'll be turned against him and uh, will destroy him. But if he is truly from Allah, what are you going to do? Because some of the things that he promised you uh, about, you will encounter and you will find and you will see. And also this is very interesting uh, verse because Allah said some, not all, because some of the, uh, the, the signs uh, some generation, generations will, sh will see, the others will not. And also there will be sometimes misunderstanding. It might be a clear sign for somebody, for the other he might not admit it. So always they should concentrate on the uh, truth and not by trying to uh, put obstacles uh, in front of them. Like, yes, we believe just in the finality of prophethood and because of that we are going to reject the whole of the claim of Hadrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad without thinking about it. So it's a very dangerous, actually, concept and they should take care of that. Okay, um, we, we, obviously it was there. Rashid Ahmed Saab asked one question and I, I think conversation and discussion on this can continue but there are other questions we've received 
in relation to this as well. And I want to just carry on uh, with this concept of hadiths. And the next question we have is from uh, Shafiq Khan in Marseille in France. Uh, Jazakumullah Shafiq Saab for your question. Um, and he asks, uh, the first element of his question is, all authentic historical traditions reveal that the compan companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had unanimously waged a war on the claimants to prophethood and their adherence after the demise of the Holy Prophet. Uh, he gives the example of Musallima is particularly significant. The man did not deny Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He claimed though that God had appointed him as a co-prophet with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to share this task and he then goes on to talk about the actions etc. Azhar Hanif Saab, if I could come to you, first of all right away in the question. At no point did the promised Messiah declare himself to be anything but someone who was a devout follower of the Holy Prophet Wasallam. and at no point did he ever claim that he was of, was below, of some equivalent status. He never claimed that. Um, this allegation therefore the comparison uh, has no comparison. It, to it has uh, no comparison and actually no relevance to even the subject we're discussing. It's a completely separate issue mm -hmm. in the history of Islam itself. Because when we look at the issue of Muslimah and others of, the, of that nature during the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. Sallallahu mm -hmm. who was the leader of the Muslim world, who was following the, the revelation of Quran, how to implement it, how to exact justice when necessary, he took no action against this individual. Mm -hmm. He understood clearly, as was mentioned very beautifully, that Quran has not given us the right to interfere in the belief of a man who's claiming to be a prophet. That is a matter between that man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the, in the Quran very clearly it says, Allah will seize this man and no one can hold, hold me back. Indeed. He did not direct Prophet Muhammad sallam, you go seize him and, and no one will be able to prevent you from doing it. The action is now given only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The danger of this line of thinking has spilled into the blood of Muslims over the course of centuries where they are condemning each other as being false this or wrong in that and if a prophet ever appeared make a claim they would begin to kill this, these individuals who take the matter in their own hands. Very dangerous blasphemy laws are now being uh, enacted in, in certain countries on the same premise. If your belief is contrary to our own or contrary to the majority we have been given somehow a right from Allah to attack that individual or to imprison that person and in some cases even to put them to death. So the very principle being actually hidden in, in the question is this, does man have the right to stand up in opposition to one who claims to be a false prophet? And the Quran says no, the Sunnah says no. And in the case he's mentioning of the companions, the, the early Khulafa, why did they do it? It was not because the man was claiming to be a prophet, it's because at that point, the unique circumstances were there in the Muslim world. Hazrat Abu Bakr anhu, he was also the head of state. So it was a political... He was the head war. of the state. Right. What was the man doing that was causing a problem? Not his claim to be a prophet. He was, in, he was uh, in arresting, he was uh, seizing people, he was executing people, he was promoting all kinds of filth in society, he was creating corruption and disruption in society. He had to put that down. So it wasn't, and this is quite an important point, because the <coughs> Shafiq Saab actually uses the example, this particular example of Muslim as the reason and the action that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq took against uh, him as a proof of the fact that this is how the Muslims united. But the fact of matter is that it was against what he was doing, his actions, not his claim. What he was doing as his actions, for if it was his claim, why then did not the greatest messenger on Indeed. earth take so action in his lifetime? Why not? He, he didn't need to wait for Hazrat Abu Bakr to be appointed a Khalifa to take up that action. Actually, his claim was at the time of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it's very clear in the history that he sent a letter to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, from Musaylama Rasulullah, from Musaylama Messenger of Allah, to Muhammad Messenger of Allah. He recognized, yes, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he said, I am a Messenger of Allah, and he wanted to negotiate with the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to divide the, uh, the state or something like that. 
Uh, then the Holy Prophet وسلم, sent him back from Muhammad Rasulullah to Musaylam Adelayar. You are not a prophet. This is the only thing that uh, he uh, mentioned. Uh, and the land is in the, uh, in the hands of Allah. And Allah will give this uh, heritage to the bias uh, people in the future. Which means this will be the judgment of Allah in the future. So the Holy Prophet وسلم, at that time was in a great power by the way. And he was able to defeat him or to destroy his state or his people very quickly. Indeed. But he didn't make any action. And he knew uh, truth and uh, 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 truth will prevail at the end. And Allah will give the heritage to the biased people. And this is exactly what's happened at the time of Hadrat Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So that's actually a very interesting uh, question. Because as Azhar Hanif Sahib mentioned, uh, the Holy Quran gave us the instructions how to deal with such people. But on the contrary, these people, they think uh, that uh, in their mentality now, unfortunately, if anybody claims to be a prophet of God, that means the only thing to do is to fight him uh, or, and to kill him, which means it's a very dangerous, very dangerous. Very and dangerous, and, uh, and it's not an in Islamic, and, and indeed. Imagine if Isa salam, were in their belief system were mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. we, we, they pushed Mr. Ghulam Ahmed aside for a moment. Imagine if the true claimant came amongst those thousand false ones mm -hmm. and they, they misinterpret uh, again that this is the right one, they would kill him too, based on this uh, you know, agenda they have as a common agenda. So it's a very, very dangerous way of approaching a spiritual matter. We're sort of coming to the close of the program. In the last few minutes, uh, the meme stop, just coming to you, I, from the conversations we've had, and clearly it's quite clear what the Arab definition of the word Khatam is. Um, Shahid Ahmed Saab from London also asks, his question in part has been answered, but he says, you know, it's almost saying from the first century up to the present day, the entire Muslim world, and includes the Arab world in this, unanimously take the view, this is what Khatam Nabin means. In your conversations, in your discussions that you have with other Arab scholars, when that question comes up, clearly from the evidence which we have from the Holy Quran primarily, mm. but also from general usage. Mm. Why can they not accept on this point what uh, the true definition is? Actually, uh, he mentioned also a false, uh, false argument, by the way, because it wasn't the belief mm. of all the Muslim scholars oh, and Muslim ummah in the whole history. On the contrary, we have many proofs. We have also many references. Maybe he can go back to our website and he can find different scholars in different ages who have the same concept as our concept. They, yes, they believe Islam is the last religion and there will be no book after the Holy Quran, but they were believing that the word Khatam al Nabiyyin or the expression Khatam al Nabiyyin means he is the last law bearing prophet, first of all, many of the scholars. And the other thing, they were believing that he is the greatest and the highest. And some of them, like Al Hakim al Tirmidhi, Maybe if you have the reference, uh, Azhar Hanif Sahib. Actually, he mentioned if somebody has a belief of that or has the concept uh, of Khatam al-Nabiyyin, that means uh, he is the last prophet. That means he's fool. This is the interpretation of the fool people. <laughs> Uh, and it's very interesting. So uh, maybe some uh, contemporary scholars try to impose this and they would say this is in whole history, the whole Muslim Ummah were understanding Khatam al nabiyyin to be the last prophet. It's incorrect so completely. This is a revered scholar. Is there yes. a you have this? Uh, one of his uh, quotes, and he's mentioned a few of them, but just, just take this very short one. He says, now can the glory and superiority of Muhammad be manifested if we claim that he was the last in time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, uh, to appear in the world. This is no doubt an interpretation of the foolish and ignorant. Mm -hmm. well, he's making this very bold statement. That, uh, That's very clear. And with that bold statement, uh, viewers, um, we've come to the end of our time for this program, but I'm sure we'll be returning to the subject of Khatma al Nabin. And I, I would like to thank my very distinguished panel, Jahangir Saab, Hazrat Saab, and Tamim Saab, for your very scholarly contributions. Um, the hour has passed us by very quickly, but as I said, we have other questions on this, and I'm sure we'll return to it on future programs. And to you, viewers, thank you once again for watching Faith Matters. Please do give us your comments. You know what the email is it's faithmatters at mta.tv, and the fax number once more is 44687. 
8037. Thank you to you, Jazakumullah. Keep the questions coming. But from all of us here on Faith Matters in London, until the next time, a very warm Asalaamu Alaikum.